Hello and welcome to Mysteries of Science. I'm Stevie, the Deputy Editor of Science and Nature, the monthly magazine by the team behind The Week Junior. And I'm Michael. On this podcast, we investigate weird events, strange creatures and mysterious places. And I'm sure long-time listeners of the podcast will join me in welcoming back Stevie. Hi, Stevie. Hello. <laughs> it's great to be back. And I want to dig into this week's episode. So... Tell me, what mystery are we investigating today, Michael? Well, Stevie, I don't actually need to say it out loud because I'm going to send a message straight to your brain and to all the listeners' brains as well. I'm going to do my best Professor X impression here. Can you tell what it is yet? No. (sighs) No, I haven't got it. Sorry. I feel like you've tried to tell me something, but it's just not coming through. Okay, fine. I'll I'll tell you. It's... (laughs) Telepathy, which, if you hadn't guessed by my demonstration there, is the ability to send messages using just your brain and to read people's minds too. Right, okay. So, well, I think we've learnt all that we need to learn about that and you definitely are not telepathic, Michael. So, are there people out there that can actually do this? Well, let's find out. We've assembled some top telepathic experts to help us out. So let's find out how to read minds. This is Mysteries of Science. Okay, so telepathy, where do we start? Well, I gave us all a little explanation and failed demonstration of what it is, So, but why don't we get an actual expert who can explain it to us properly? I am Emeritus Professor Chris French. Uh, Up until a couple of years back, I uh, was at Goldsmiths, University of London, in the Department of Psychology there, and up until recently, I've been the head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit. Hi, Chris. So, some of you might remember Chris from our Ghostbusters episode. He's the author of a book all about paranormal activity and the science of weird stuff. Now, you mentioned the word animalistic. I think I've said that right there. Chris, so what is that exactly? That's always the first question I get. (laughs) Uh, Anomalistic psychology is primarily focused upon seeing if we can come up with non-paranormal explanations for ostensibly paranormal experiences. So people who think they've been abducted by aliens or think they've seen a ghost or claim to have psychic powers, maybe all that stuff's true, but I am a skeptic, I have to admit. Uh, And so I'm interested in, well, what other ways of explaining those kinds of experiences are there? Can we come up with non-paranormal explanations and wherever possible, can we see if we can produce some evidence to support our our counter explanations, our non-paranormal explanations? Well, that sounds like an absolutely fascinating field of science and quite similar, actually, to what we do here on Mysteries of Science, trying to find out the truth behind strange stories. So tell us, Chris, what is telepathy? Telepathy is one type of extrasensory perception, or ESP. There are three types. First, there's telepathy, which is the alleged ability for minds to make direct contact. So in other words, mind reading or even thought broadcasting. And... There's also clairvoyance, which is the alleged ability to pick up information from remote locations without using the known sensory channels. And uh, finally, there's precognition, which is the alleged ability to see into the future. So when a magician or a performer claims to have read someone's mind, what are they actually doing? One very simple demonstration that I often include in my own talks is I say to the audience, uh, I'm going to... I want to test how psychic you are. I'm going to see if I can transmit a thought from my mind into your mind. I'm going to keep it very simple. Uh, I'm going to think of a number between 1 and 10, not 3 because that's too obvious. So the first number that comes into your head between 1 and 10, but not 3, make a mental note of it now. And then I ask the audience. Now, obviously, you know, if you've got a big audience, some people are going to get it right just by chance. So we only get excited if it's more than about 10% of you. And ask people then to put their hands up, and typically you'll get about a third of the audience will pick the number seven. And uh, it can be quite impressive. And there's lots of demonstrations like that. That is an example of what's known as population stereotypes. We don't really know why, but we do know that responses tend to cluster in predictable ways. Um, so that'd be one way that you could pass off. Okay, hands up. Who else was thinking of the number seven? Because that's the exact number I had in my head when he was speaking. <laughs> So we'd love to hear from you too. Why not send us a voice note to funkidslive.com forward slash mysteries and hit the big red button. So Chris gave us one example there of how something that might seem like telepathy actually has a very logical explanation. I wonder, are there any other examples of something like that happening? There's a very famous um, 
a story about so-called clever Hans. Hans was a horse back at the beginning of the towards the beginning of the of the, the last century, um, where it was claimed that this horse could uh, answer questions set by its owner. So you you know you say you say you could throw your question, say um, what's the square root of nine, and Hans would clop 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 three times and you know and also you could use obviously more difficult coding systems to spell out words and so on and so forth um and this was taken very seriously by quite a lot of people at the time including some very kind of you know learned intelligent people um but what was actually going on was uh, solved by a psychologist called oscar Fungst, who noted a couple of things first that the horse clever hands he could only ever answer the question if his trainer was in the room at the time and secondly he could only answer the question if the trainer knew the answer Uh, and it turned out that what it was was not actually that hands was picking up on any kind of telepathy from his owner or anything like this he was watching his owner and the owner either intentionally or unintentionally i think most people think unintentionally if in if Say, for example, we said, what's the square root of nine? The owner would uh, uh, he'd, he'd clop once, clop twice, clop three times. And on the third time, the owner would just kind of gently, slightly raise his head, you know, uh, to indicate, right, stop now. <laughs> and that's what was going on. Um, so, you know, we again, you know, we can be fooled by stuff like that. We think we can't be, but actually you have to be very, very careful. I love that story. What an amazing horse. Clever hands, the telepathic horse. Yeah, maybe we should do a whole episode on on psychic animals and whether they're really telepathic or, as with clever hands, there's actually a a little secret trick going on. They do that quite a lot, though, just before big sporting events. Next one, before the Olympics, let's get it in. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get an animal in the studio here with us to to predict (laughs) the Olympics. Well, we've learned some techniques for how we can fool people into thinking we're reading their minds. But I wonder whether technology technology can do something similar. Well, Stevie, let's say hello to our next guest. My name's Catherine Hewlick, and I'm the author of books and articles about science for kids. Uh, I've written the book Welcome to the Future, which is about how technology could change the world in the future, and also Strange But True, which is about 10 mysteries um, and how science can help us understand them. And another thing I wanted to say about telepathy is that this is something that I was super interested in when I was a kid. My favorite book was Matilda, which is about a girl who can move things with her mind. And another favorite book by the same author, Road Dahl, was The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, which is about a man who learns how to see without his eyes. So he has a form of telepathy where he can kind of see things with his mind. And I absolutely love both of those books. So this is something I've been fascinated by from a very young age. Welcome back to the show, Catherine. Some of our longtime listeners will recognize Catherine from previous episodes, including teleportation. We're talking about a different type of telly today. So Catherine, the examples you gave us previously were from Roald Dahl books, but is there any way of doing this in the real world? Yeah, so in 2023, there was some super exciting news out of the University of Texas at Austin. So they had used AI in combination with fMRI. So that's like the big like machine that people lie inside and it can kind of read your brain activity. Uh, So they use those two technologies together and were able to reconstruct words that people were um, were basically they were like listening to stories and it was able to reconstruct what story they were listening to without knowing what the words were. Okay, that sounds amazing. So AI, which uh, Catherine just mentioned there is that stands for artificial intelligence and is when a machine or computer is able to do something that would ordinarily require human intelligence. So Catherine, could you explain how the AI worked with the fMRI that you were mentioning to read people's minds? First, each of these people had to lie very still in this brain scanner and listen to 16 hours of spoken stories while this machine measured the blood flow in their brain. That's what fMRI does. It measures where blood is going in your brain. And that can kind of be used uh, to represent what the neurons in the brain are doing. So the neurons are the little cells in the brain that... um, basically talk to each other with electrical signals and that forms your thoughts. Like the way all these billions of neurons in your brain are talking with electricity forms your thoughts, but they need blood in order to do this. So fMRI looks at where blood is going and kind of uses that to see which neurons are most active, which parts of the brain are most active. 
And then AI took this pattern of where's the blood going, you know, which neurons are talking to each other. And it matched that to the words the people were hearing during the 16 hours of listening to stories and said, okay, I kind of see this part's active when they're reading about apples. This part's active when they're reading about walking. That's so clever, isn't it? So you can tell what people are reading, what stories are people are reading from where the blood flows in the brain. So if that was the first stage of the experiment, what happened next? So then these people who'd had, who'd gone through this long process, went back in the scanner and listened to stories that, you know, the researchers didn't know what they said, the AI didn't know what they said. And now they were like, can it predict what this story is just from the brain activity? Because it's kind of learned how these patterns match up from that long period of practicing and training. And so it was able to come pretty close. I mean, it wasn't perfect. It made a lot of mistakes, but the fact that it could come close at all is really, really cool. And you know what else is neat is they could predict um, descriptions of silent movies. So like if someone was watching a movie, it could use the brain activity to kind of describe what was happening in the movie because we kind of, you know, those same regions of the brain that are active when we read words are also active when we see pictures of the same thing. So that does sound absolutely incredible, like real life telepathy, but it doesn't sound very convenient, does it? I mean, having to lie down somewhere for 16 hours, there must be a way to make it easier. Well, um, Elon Musk, I don't know whether you know him, the man behind SpaceX and Tesla, well, he wants to do just that. So he's invented a special type of chip that goes actually inside the brain. And he's actually named it telepathy. Well, it also goes by the name Neuralink as well. But as Catherine explains, this also might not be as convenient as you think. And the problem there with what Neuralink, uh, with Elon Musk and Neuralink, is that they're actually going to put something inside the brain. So you've got to do brain surgery. You've got to cut your head open. Um, although there are ways to do it without cutting your head open. There's ideas of like sending like little, little, you know, pieces of technology up through your blood. And uh, there's other ways to do it. But no matter how you do it, it's invasive. You've got to put technology inside a person's brain and the brain doesn't like that it's like nope it you know builds scar tissue it you know has an allergic reaction like there's 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 dangers there's health dangers to putting something inside someone's head yeah okay maybe lying down for 16 hours doesn't sound so bad anymore um but but why does it have to go inside the brain i mean why can't it be you know just on your forehead or something why does it actually have to go inside so the best way I've heard this explained is that trying to read the brain from outside the skull is like trying to follow a soccer game by listening from outside the stadium. That's my favorite comparison here. Like you can kind of tell what's going on from outside the stadium. You can hear a bunch of cheers if someone scores, but you don't really know what's happening. And to know what's happening, you've got to get inside. Okay, that, that makes sense. It's like following a, a game from outside the stadium. I'm, I'm still not sure if it's for me, though, but that does make sense. Yeah, maybe not in reading minds, but it's, it's not all bad. Some people with disabilities have actually used this technology to learn how to walk again. They've had really positive results with it. But people have tested this. Um, And they've tested it with people who really need um, assistance, like people with paralysis or other forms of disability where they've lost control of part of their body or, you know, people with epilepsy. Um, Sometimes this can help, you know, some of their symptoms having these electrodes inside their brain or these these machines um, or technology inside their brain. And I've actually interviewed two people who have gone through this, two volunteers who chose to get electrodes in their brain. and they were just they were just a lot of fun to talk to. Uh, one of them, Scott Embry, told me that he feels like Dr. Octopus because he learned to control a robot arm with his mind. Uh, he had an electrode, you know, he had brain surgery, he had an electrode put in his brain and he was able to move an arm just by thinking about it. So that's amazing then, and one very positive kind of use of this sort of technology. But I wonder what it would be like in a world where we could get these either chips inside the brain or however it's done, you know, where we could all be telepathic and all send messages with our mind or or read minds. I mean, imagine how much fun that would be. I mean, if I was, you know, in, in shopping for food or whatever and couldn't remember what I needed, rather than having to get my phone out and send a message and do a signal, I could just, you know, think, you know, what do I need to get? And, you know, some of my family could go, oh, we need potatoes. I'm like, great. And I wouldn't even have to do anything. You know, imagine how cool that would be. That'd be so cool. I was more thinking along the lines of if you're in an exam, you could, 
you know, focus on the examiner and be like, what's the answer to this question? I really need to know. That would be so cool, wouldn't it? You could steal answers from everyone. You wouldn't, <laughs> everyone you wouldn't need to kind of creep over and look at their exam paper. You could just like read their mind. Yeah. yeah. How would you so mark good. exams in a telepathic world? Oh, I don't know. It would be impossible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Catherine, what do you think? What, what would a world with telepathy be like? If someone is, you know, reading your thoughts, how do you prevent them from, you know, knowing things you don't want them to know? Uh, how do you... Um, how do you deal with invasions into your, like, it, see, it sounds great that I could like text my friend with my mind, but what if my, you know, what if a company is also sending me ads through my mind? That doesn't sound so fun, but allowing for one thing also automatically allows for the other. Like when we got cell phones, it seemed great that we could call people all the time, but people could also call us all the time. So it goes both ways, you know, and it's the same thing with this type of technology. You know, you being able to reach out to others through your mind means they can reach out to you as well. I hadn't thought of it like that. Telepathy goes both ways. So if you could pe- read people's mind, then they can read yours. Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I want people <laughs> inside my head now. Um, right, I think it's time, Stevie, that we brought out our old friend, the mysteriometer. Yes, I love this part. This is the scale from 0 to 100, where we know where 0 means we know nothing and 100 means we know everything. So I wonder where our experts think that telepathy comes with this. Could it happen one day? I think an important part of scepticism is always to be open to the possibility that you might be wrong. And maybe they can refine these techniques to the stage where they would actually convince somebody like me. So even on that, I wouldn't, I put my personal view on a scale from zero to a hundred would be the chances that genuine telepathy exists I would put it about five. So I could be wrong. I might have to change my mind. Maybe my scepticism is misplaced. I'm open to the possibility that that might happen, but I'm not really expecting it to happen. Um, you know, there are, there are many parapsychologists who are absolutely convinced. They would say 100. We've definitely established it's real. Uh, there are many skeptics who would say zero. No chance at all. I'm, I'm kind of say I leave open the possibility that maybe it's real, but If I had to bet my house on it, I would definitely bet against. Oh, that's so hard to say. Um, I mean, it really depends on the technology to be able to put this thing in someone's head safely. uh, Because I don't really think the kind with the giant machine that you have to lie inside is going to work in daily life. (laughs) Um, So, and I don't know that much about medicine, but I just, you know, I would say at least two decades, probably maybe more. Um, And also the other thing is like, just because we can do it doesn't mean we will. I mean, it sometimes feels like technology is, you know, this breakneck pace that we can't stop it. But there's a lot of things that, you know, we've chosen that we just don't want to do this with our technology, like flying cars. We don't really have flying cars, but we could because we can make helicopters. It's just that people don't really want that because it's, you know, dangerous to and noisy and polluting to fly around everywhere and expensive. Um, so, I mean, it, it's just because we can do it doesn't necessarily mean we will. And I want to make sure kids feel empowered that if you don't want this, you know, make your voice heard. If you do want it, you can also work on it and, and, if, and you argue for it. So it's not necessarily something that happens to us, but something that we have a role in creating. It's a very good point there from, from Catherine. You know, things like telepathy could be possible one day, but only if we want them to be. Um, if you'd like to read more about mind reading, then you can read our telepathy feature in the latest issue of the Wheat Junior Science and Nature magazine out now. Yeah, it's brilliant. So we would love to hear from you. What would you like to do if you had telepathic powers? Um, perhaps you want to try out some of the mind reading techniques that Chris has said earlier. As we said, you can send us a voice note to funkidslive.com forward slash mysteries or send us an email at hello at science-nature.co.uk. Now, of course, I don't need to uh, tell you to come back in two weeks' time for our next mystery because I already sent that message to all of your brains earlier on. And of course, you already know what we're talking about. But just to be on the safe side, we're going to go walking with dinosaurs and see if they're still live and kicking today. But until then, stay stay curious. curious.